Good morning and good afternoon to all of you for joining our live webinar today, Electrophysiological Investigation of Integral Membrane Proteins Using the Orbit Mini, Experiments on Lipid Bilayers Made Easy. My name is Jason Villagomez, Marketing Manager at Nanion Technologies, and will be your moderator for today's event. Joining us as a presenter will be my colleague, Dr. Conrad Weisbrod, Senior Scientist and Product Manager of the Orbit Product Family. Today's presentation is as follows. Conrad will provide an introduction covering the basics and principles behind the technology. Additionally, he will look at practical topics like preparation of lipid membranes and controlling temperature during an experiment. We will then transition to a video with live commentary where Conrad will showcase experimental workflow to highlight the ease of use of the Orbit Mini setup for experiments on artificial membranes. As such, we've, we have prepared a remote demonstration from our in-house lab. Upon completion of the presentation, we will hold a live Q&A session and as such welcome you to ask our presenter questions at any time throughout the talk. You can log a question via the chat window found on the right hand side of your screen. If you happen to experience any technical difficulties at any point in time, please inform us via the chat box. Additionally, today's presentation will be made available on demand shortly upon completion, inclusive of a transcribed copy of the live Q&A session. I will now turn over the presentation to Conrad for the start of the talk. Thank you very much, Jason, for the introduction, and welcome everyone to this year's Orbit Mini webinar. Um, so the agenda for today would be that I swiftly explain why you would perform bilayer experiments in the first place and why I would recommend to use the Orbit Mini. I would subsequently showcase the actual workflow of an experiment on the Orbit Mini by using the translocation of polymers through alpha hemolysin as an example. So Nanayan is best known for the devices we offer for whole cell patch clamping, which basically means the electrical recording of whole living cells. Something completely different, however, would be experiments on artificial bilayers for which we offer the devices of the orbit family. So why would anyone choose to perform experiments on bilayers? Well, you could, for example, investigate proteins of membranes you could not reach by patch clamping, like the ones of the SR, the ER, the nucleus, mitochondria, or basically any other cell organelle. This approach would furthermore simplify experiments on single channels, as you would not have to deal with any background or artifacts, and as you would have a realistic chance to investigate single proteins on a regular basis. You could also investigate species like antimicrobial peptides, toxins, DNA pores, or basically anything that will form an aperture in the lipid membrane. Finally, you could perform single molecule detection, exploiting translocation through nanopores, as will be showcased in the experiment later on. And what makes the Orbit Mini so special for this task? Well, take a classical BLM setup. They are totally fine, but have a large footprint due to the Faraday cage and typically only offer one recording channel via a single channel amplifier and an additional digitizer. The Orbit Mini, in contrast, offers four separate recording channels at a way smaller footprint, but otherwise same data quality and lower price. And due to the horizontal alignment of the lipid membranes, the Orbit Mini can be placed under a microscope to allow for an additional optical readout while recording the electrical signal. The Orbit Mini is extremely small, around the same size as an external hard drive, and is only powered and connected via USB cable. The E4 amplifier inside the Orbit Mini offers four completely separate recording channels, meaning there is no multiplexing whatsoever involved, and all signals are recorded fully in parallel. The noise level is comparable to the standard amplifiers in the field, and you can record all channels at sampling rates up to 200 kHz. Let's have a look at the actual measuring chamber, the MECA 4 chip. As the name already suggests, we are using an array of four cylindrical cavities as support for the artificial lipid membranes. We offer cavities of various diameters for different experimental needs. Please contact us for more information about this point. The bottom of each cavity is a driven electrode, whereas the chip's top forms the ground electrode. So the chip itself forms the whole measuring chamber. No other part of the device gets in contact with buffers, lipids, and proteins and would have to be cleaned, 
And you will never have to deal with cross-contamination upon changing the target. And how exactly can you generate lipid membranes on this chip? Well, you would span the cavities in the chip surface with a lipid membrane each. These membranes are painted from lipids and organic solvent, so the classical black lipid membrane approach. You could therefore use a paintbrush or paint with a Teflon tip or glass rod. All works just fine, but we would however recommend to generate the bilayers with a lipid-covered air bubble. I will explicitly demonstrate this method of painting bilayers with an Eppendorf pipette later on in the following video. And a frequently asked question would be if it is possible to generate asymmetric buffer conditions for your experiments. Well, yes. At first, you would fill the chip and thus the cavities with, with trans solution, meaning the solution that you would be below the membranes in the experiments. Then you would paint the membranes and successively exchange the buffer above the membranes on the so-called cis side. This exchange can quickly and conveniently be done with the pipette without breaking the membranes. And finally, I want to introduce an optional add-on, the temperature control system for the Orbit Mini. It offers the possibility to freely control the experiment's temperature in a range of 5 to 50 degrees, which means that you can actively heat and cool. You can set and monitor the desired temperature conveniently via the recording software and the temperature control will keep it constant virtually for hours. This enables not only experiments to be carried out at physiological temperature, but also the investigation of temperature sensitive species like for example trip channels. The cold sensitive channel trip A1 can be activated by lowering the temperature, whereas the heat sensitive channel trip V1 exhibits more activity at elevated temperatures. You could furthermore also alter the kinetics of an experiment via control of the temperature. You could slow down translocation by lowering the temperature and thus widen individual events. Like this, you could catch events that might otherwise be too short to be detected. On the other hand, you could increase currents and even frequency for faster data generation by heating the whole system up. Both would be available at the push of the button in the software. All right. That's it for the introduction. Let's now switch over to the video and see how performing an experiment actually looks like. All right, so you would connect the Orbit Mini device to a computer by the push of one button and immediately see the four current signals corresponding to the four separate recording channels. To start an experiment, you would then first mount the test cell to calibrate the device and to verify the correct data readout. You open the Faraday cage, slide in the test cell, and close the Faraday cage again. We will shortly follow these exact steps in the interface of the recording software so you know how this would look like. You can clearly see some disturbance and 50 Hz pickup up on insertion of the test cell with open Faraday cage. All disturbances disappear, however, once the Faraday cage is closed again. And you can now calibrate by simply activating the automated compensation function. You can then apply a test pulse to read out capacitance and resistance values of resistors mounted on the test cell. These resistance values are specified, so you can verify the correct data readout immediately by comparing them to the calculated values given by the software. The Orbit Mini is now already calibrated and you can mount the actual MECA chip for your experiment by simply taking out the test cell and replacing it with a MECA 4 recording chip. You would then close the Faraday cage again and begin the experiment. Even with the closed Faraday cage, you'd still have access to the chip, so you can conveniently fill it with buffer solution by simply adding it with a pipette from above. But how can you be sure that the small cavities on the chip are actually filled with buffer? Well, you would apply a constant holding potential and observe the current signal. As the signals in this case stay at zero picoampere, there must be air entrapped inside the cavities. In order to remove this air, you can steer the solution with a pipette. 
Or you can, for example, use the plunger of a small syringe to force buffer into the cavities by gently pressing on the chip from above. You can follow this process in the software. The current signals go from zero to overload as the driven and ground electrodes are now in direct contact through the buffer solution. And you can now start to paint the membranes. I typically use the lipid DPH PC and octane at a concentration of 5 mg per milliliter. And now comes the main painting trip, trick. You dip a pipette tip into the lipid solution without aspirating anything. And then you would even remove the tiny amount of lipid solution that might be in the tip of, uh, due to capillary forces. And you actually paint the membranes with the pipette. And how can you follow the painting process in the software? Well, the signals would go back from overload to zero as the generated membranes will now block the current flow again. But let's have a closer look at this pivotal process again. You would use the lipid-covered pipe tip to form a lipid-covered air bubble successively over the four cavities. I will provide a publication explaining this approach for membrane generation in detail. Once all membranes are formed, you can use the before-mentioned test parts again to now read out the capacitances of the membranes and verify that those are functional lipid bilayers. Solvent, air, or dirt obstructing the current flow will give rise to small capacitances, whereas membranes will display way larger values. Now that you have four membranes in place, you can continue by adding the protein. In this case, alpha hemolysin to the chip by simple, simple addition with an Eppendorf pipette. It is beneficial to thoroughly steer the solution after protein addition to bring the proteins into close proximity to the membranes. The membranes stay stable during this whole process. To be able to follow the insertion of alpha hemolysin ports in the current signal, you can then apply a holding potential again. And I additionally use a short voltage pulse to transiently disturb the membranes and facilitate the insertion of alpha hemolysin pores into the membranes. As you can observe, several open alpha hemolysin pores readily insert into the membranes, giving rise to elevated current levels. In this example, you have the problem of having too many insertions at once as the applied potential drives more and more pores into the membranes. For a meaningful translocation experiment, however, you would ideally need exactly one pore per membrane. Fortunately, you can just repaint the membranes with the protein present and wait for a membrane bearing exactly one single alpha hemolysin pore. With exactly one pore present, you can in this example directly add polyethylene glycol molecules to the pore at a given holding potential. These PEGs will form spherical particles in aqueous solution, which will translocate through the alpha hemolysin pore and transiently block the open pore current in the process, resulting in characteristic blockage events in the detected signal. Of note, the recording software offers various analysis tools that can be applied in real time while recording. You could, for example, generate an online histogram of the current signal to check for distributions and different current levels that, that might not be clearly visible from the detected signal as such. Further information about this exact experiment and the information yield will also be provided in form of further reading. All right, I hope the short overview was helpful to illustrate how an experiment on the Orbit Mini is carried out. I will now hand over back to Jason for the Q&A session. Thank you, Conrad. Let's take a look at some of the questions that we had received. The first one, are the mecha chip consumables a single-use item? Um, oh, no. Um, they're definitely no single-use item. They can be thoroughly cleaned and reused several times, but the actual lifetime really depends on the uh, conditions that you would use for your experiments. So the higher the salt concentrations and the higher the applied potentials, the sooner the electrodes will wear out. But of note, you have the possibility in the software to switch off channels that you are not recording and that would have a broken membrane to not deplete the electrodes while you still record from the other channels. So these chips, I would say, are definitely good for a whole day of recording, probably even way longer. Another question that we received, 
how does the temperature control work and how is it connected to the device? Um, so it's connected to the device um, with one cable for the temperature sensor and uh, some, some, tubing, some tubing for the liquid cooling. And it's connected to the computer only by a USB. And uh, in the Orbit Mini as such, you have a Peltier element directly below the chip. And this Peltier element you can heat or cool and could therefore also heat and cool the whole chip. So the solutions and the whole chip get cooled or heated up during the experiment. And a follow-up to that, does the temperature control introduce additional noise? Well, if you heat up the solution and if you heat up your whole experiment, you will um, add a bit of additional noise due to more thermal motion. That's additional white noise, nothing you can do about that. But if the temperature control will not introduce any artifacts or magnetic coupling whatsoever. So no unwanted additional noise. Do you have the temperature sensor in the buffer? Um, well, no. If you would do that, two things. The chips uh, are the consumables and they would become really, really expensive. And you would actually stick an antenna right in your buffer. So we do have an, a temperature sensor at the Peltier element, so we can read out that temperature. But we provide together with the temperature control a thermometer together with a thermocouple. So you could set a certain temperature, let's say in your lab at your room temperature 40 degrees, and then read out the temperature on the chip surface, which then might be 37 degrees, and you would actually do that once, so you would know what temperature to set to reach a certain wanted temperature for your experiment. And then lastly, how do I actually get my protein of choice inside the bilayer? All right, yeah, that's, that's a good question. That's a fundamental question. Um, let me answer it like this. The bilayers we have on the Orbit Mini setup are exactly the same uh, like the bilayers you would have on any other classical bilayer setup, meaning that you, when you are lucky, you have uh, a hydrophilic uh, protein, like for example in our example alpha hemolysin, that you could just add to your buffer solution. Um, but what you would normally do, you would purify, for example, ion channels or other hydrophobic um, transmembrane proteins into detergent micelles, and you, you would then add small amounts of your purified protein, and you would have an extreme and sudden dilution of the detergent, and that would basically destroy the micelles, so the hydrophobic proteins would have to go inside the membrane. Or you could uh, fuse proteolysosomes to these membranes, and for this application we would actually recommend large membrane diameters, and protocols for the incorporation of membrane proteins into artificial membranes can be found in literature for a wide range of examples. As a reminder, we will be making this available on demand. You can find this subsequently on our website, and we're happy to assist you going forward in any of your future experiments. Do not hesitate to get in touch with us at your next convenience.